Thank you so much for hitting play today. Super excited that you have chosen. Interesting word there. Chosen. We'll get back to that in a moment. Chosen to do so today. Really excited. Really excited about not only this week. Want to have you stay tuned for the exciting conclusions of The Footprints. So next week is going to be season finale day. You're not going to want to miss it. Before we get to season finale day, we got to kind of have like a precursor before season finale day is upon us. So with that said, when you hear the word and the phrasing discipleship, what comes to mind? Now for me, let me be candid. For me, what immediately comes to mind really truly is Mr. Miyagi. And Daniel, son, wax on, wax off, paint the fence, sand the deck. You know, all these things, the crane kick comes to mind for me. For those of you who are maybe inside the steeple where all the people should be, you might think of discipleship in a different way and you may even be chosen. Here we are. So help me welcome in my guests all the way from the Pacific Northwest, just straight up the I-5 from me, my good friend Caesar. How are you, sir? Good. I'm real good. How are you doing today, man? Sounds like you're pretty amped up. A little bit of coffee going on, I can feel. Well, you know, I, I just thought I would drink and, and indulge in the beverage of Washington, truly. Yeah, yeah. We're all kind of coffee snobs at this point. <laughs> Is there a bad cup of coffee in Washington? Yes. Okay. But I will not name names. <laughs> I was of just going to say, name drop. Here we go. No, yeah, there's like two, there's sort of two schools of thought. Okay. And I'm clearly in one camp, and people who are in the other who like to have their coffee smell like flowers and t- taste like the strength of tea. Not so much for me. And maybe you know what I'm talking about. I don't know. I really don't. Because here's the thing we have down here in my neck of the woods, we have a coffee company called Good Bean Coffee. And their their claim to fame truly is that it is never bitter. Mm. We owned a cafe, sort of rec- breakfast all day place for eight years in Tacoma. We have great coffee. We still get that. We sold the restaurant, but we still have the hookup for that. So we kind of got spoiled on really good custom roasted coffee. So <laughs> that is on my to-do list. I want to find a coffee spot. Sponsor, truly, because I think enough people drink it, you know, Ooh. that it is the beverage of choice that I truly could use it into like a giveaway, you know, like we're mm, getting in your boy. shoes and in your cup all at once. You, you got I don't me know. thinking here. <laughs> all right. Well, if you know a guy, let me know. Caesar, I love to say it Cesar, and I know that's not the correct way. It made me seem more fun, but but it is Caesar. Yeah, it's the only way it really gets pronounced, but everybody sees that A before E and flips out, man. <laughs> Just flips out on you. Have you ever had a Cesar salad? I I have gone to a restaurant and tried to order a Cesar salad, truly. Yeah. Yes. Just to be didn't funny. Didn't work out for didn't you. Didn't work sure. out. No. No. <laughs> they were like, what? You mean Caesar? I'm like, no, Cesar. And they're like, no. I love to lead off every show with this question, and that's this. What size shoes do you wear? Okay. I, I'm going to give you, I have to ask a qualifying question first. Everyday shoes or my running shoes? Because running shoes, you got to upsize. Whole yeah, little. you do. So I'm going to get the hammer I'm, toe. Yeah. I'm going to go, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go running shoes because I myself before COVID was a pretty avid runner. Like I would run yeah. 20 to 30 miles a week. Believe it or not. Yeah. My running shoe nowadays is a 13. Okay. Now here's the most important question. Brand. Of shoe. I don't even remember what my running shoes are now. You want me to go get them and look? I don't know. <laughs> no, I, 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 uh, I don't even know. Uh, I think they're currently Nike, but I'm not positive of that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm an that's A6. How, that's how much I like branding my clothing Ooh. for other people. Yeah. Ooh. You just like, hey, they work. They're running. I'm going. I'm they're good. right over here, man. I could go get them. Now you're bugging me. I'm not. <laughs> It's up to you. It's up to you entirely. No, I really not. I okay. don't care at all. I'm an Asics guy. Like when I was out running, I was running Asics Noosa is the the shoe of choice and the brand of choice. Uh, and that's the, a good one, man. And and it is, especially in the Pacific Northwest, all the rain we get, it would whoosh away. That's a technical term, by the way, whoosh away the water. They were triathlon shoes. So anytime I stepped in a puddle, it didn't matter because they would just, because they were triathlon shoes. They just, you know, took the water away. It was this crazy technology Asics has. Nice. Asics is not paying for this sponsorship, but if you're interested. I want to say maybe mine are New Balance now that I'm thinking about it. But oh, I don't New know. Balance. Okay. All right. I don't know. <laughs> no judgment. Maybe a little bit. Caesar, help me with this. For me, let, let's just jump right into it. Water's warm. We're in the deep end. 
here, maybe, or getting ready to jump into said deep end. I grew up in the church. I grew up even in a Christian and Missionary Alliance church. CNMA. CNMA. Yep. It's tough to say sometimes. CNMA. I used to be a CNMA pastor. Well, and I was too. I was in a, an associate pastor here in Medford. At that time, one of the lone CMA churches in our area and went through the Christian Missionary Alliance Leadership Academy. So I got credentialed that way through correspondence. But in that, I had this very, and I, I'm going to emphasize with my hands in the camera here so you could see me, very small chapter, almost chapter and a half was dedicated to discipleship. So I didn't grow up in a disciple, quote unquote, making church. Through a series of unfortunate events, Lemony Snicket style, my wife and, and daughter and I end up leaving said Christian Missionary Alliance Church with my credentials over there and now starting fresh over in this new church. And we get to this new church and the very first Sunday, the pastor was like, hey, here's what we're all about. We're a church that makes disciples who makes disciples, who makes disciples. How we do that is in a relational environment in home groups, care groups. Oh, question over here in the back. Yeah, this guy right right here. What is a disciple making church? What is a relational environment You're where that's me done? Here, Neil, because there's only one mission and only one reason that the church even exists on this planet. And so to not make disciples as a church would be like a Honda dealership and you come in there and they go, yeah, we don't really have Hondas. We've got some really really high def screens showing a lot of people driving Hondas. And then we tell people, get out there and drive those Hondas. But we don't sell Hondas. And that would be so sad for a Honda dealership. And or if the sales manager says, I don't drive a Honda. I don't even like Hondas. I don't drive cars, in fact. So that's, you're breaking my heart here, man. <laughs> well, what I'm trying to illustrate is the fact that I didn't grow up in that environment. Most people didn't, bro. Fast forward into my life, roughly three years ago, the church goes through a shift in, in youth leadership, which I was a part of. Church pastors, staff says, hey, read this book by the Barner Group put out called You Lost Me. And it's all about kids who are leaving the church in droves. And it breaks my heart. Like yeah. I've only wept truly over probably about a handful of books. Like I could probably name them on one hand. This book was one of them. And it got me thinking, I failed as a youth leader. I failed as a youth pastor. I failed as an associate. I failed whatever title you want to put in front of my name. I failed these people because, here we go, big drum roll, da -da 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 -da, I did not disciple them. Mm. So help me and help others. Why is disciple making so important to you? And why is that your passion lane? Why is that about waking you up in the morning? Tell me more about that. It does. It wakes me up at night. I'm not joking. Well, I... I my first experience in church was, you know, I was going in the womb. My mom was kind of carrying me to the church services. And the church that we grew up in also did zero discipleship that I can recall, like none. And even in, you know, the youth group was all just sort of pizza do ministry, lots of pizza, Mountain Dew. And then they would, you know, every once in a while, give you this big hardcore message, try to get you to raise a hand, say a magic Jesus in your heart prayer that had mostly to do with your afterlife. Could never see the relevancy of that. And nor sh how could you, how could you possibly? At 18, kind of left the program and went off and did my rock and roll lifestyle. I was a musician and playing for a living and not a very good lifestyle going with it. But along the way, had a true encounter with Christ, and it was part of a church that actually did disciple people, and we did life together in community, and they were very much like our family. And boy, oh boy, was it different. I mean, it was night and day different. Now, I have come to understand that not only can you truly learn not only about God and His Word, but you learn how to live it that way. You can't really live apart from that. But the only mission that Jesus gave the church is to make disciples. In other words, help people to walk in my ways so that, this is from John 8, they'll come to know the truth and the truth will set them free. Now, notice the order there. If you'll walk in my ways, be my disciple, then, it's a huge then in that, that verse, you will, then you will come to know the truth and that truth will set you free. It's not the other way around the way I was raised and even the way I pastored for years where we flipped it 180 out of sync. And it was, if you'll believe what we tell you is the truth and you say that Jesus in your heart prayer, the one you'll never find in scripture, then you'll get set free and then we'll disciple you, except the church didn't and still many don't, not really. They think maybe, you know, the Sunday thing gets it done. It, it's impossible or Jesus would have just done it that way. So we kind of were doing it backwards. And once... Once we saw that and understood that and began to not only invite people to walk in the ways of Jesus with us, we started seeing people becoming set free, opening up to the gospel, applied not to just their afterlife, going for that afterlife upgrade. The gospel lived out and spoken into and experienced in our marriages, in our parenting, in our work, in our 
vacationing in our identity, gender, retirement, savings, generosity, all of it. I'm 100% convinced that the gospel is meant to speak into and transform all of life, not just our afterlife. And so that's why I'm real jazzed about it. That's why it keeps me up at night, why we've given our life to resourcing. And, and my wife and I coach people in this. How do you live a lifestyle of discipleship and then help others do the same? So yeah, that's what that's that's jam, man. <laughs> I say that's your pajamas because pajamas is that's where you're comfortable. That's where you feel most Ooh. where you're like, I'm at peace. I'm at relaxed. I'm trying to have a catch on, but so far it hasn't yet. I don't know, man. Good luck with it. <laughs> but in that, listen, the flip side of that coin would be what if what if nobody disciples Caesar? What if nobody comes along and really shows you this model, this action plan of discipleship? What if nobody does that? I'm guessing you didn't just wake up and discover like, oh gosh, I've been missing the boat on discipleship. Jump way ahead in my life, and I'm a, I'm working as a pastor at a mega church in Chicagoland area. We're all about the Sunday. In fact, I'm head of production, so I got the headset on thousands of people a weekend, and it's lights, camera, action. And there's not a whole lot of, if any, discipleship going on beyond the 101, 201, 301, 401 classes, which isn't discipleship. It's all about head knowledge and a transfer of sort of church doctrine and, and sort of rules and regs. I started going on a bunch of overseas trips that we would call missions trips back in those days. Now I think life is mission, but we would go on these trips when we would be like in Sudan during the war, Sierra Leone in the war, Burma during the war, all these crazy places that were flipping out. We'd be with the church and the church was the people. They didn't have anything. They didn't have programs. They didn't have buildings. Most of these places, people are not even literate to read anything, including Bibles, wherever. The church was growing these people that were so knit together and so for each other and so full of joy, Neil. I couldn't even believe it. Like they had nothing and they were so full of joy. And by the miracle of flight, I'd leave those types of trips come home. Within 24 hours, I'd be driving down the big, long driveway to the church campus and the guys with orange cones and vests directing traffic and pushing me to the back lot. And I'd get a chip because I'm like, hey, hey, I work here. What's going on? Why do I have to park in the back? And then we'd be putting on the show and it, it started to feel, wow, what's going on here? I felt like for weeks out in the field, we were the church. We were being the church. Now we're coming home and doing church. We're putting on church and started reading the book of Acts over and over and over and looking how the people lived. We've all read Acts 2 and it sounds so beautiful. And we just started asking, what if we lived that way? What if we just lived that way all the time? I don't know, m maybe you have, Neil, lots of people have been on short-term mission trips and you go and oftentimes it's a little outside your comfort zone and maybe it's a little hot and maybe the food's not your jam. You're not getting along with everybody perfectly, but you sort of do and you pull together and you see God do amazing things and you get home and I, I used to, I, I was a missions pastor. I used to hear people say this, man, that was so amazing. I just felt so close to God and everybody. I wish we could just live like that all the time. And I'd hear that. And I just started asking God, like, well, do we get to? Can we live that way? Do we get to? And my wife and I were both on staff at that large church. We just decided we'd rather live authentically with 10 or 12 people in discipleship relationships in our neighborhood. If that was all there was, then, then pretend with thousands. And I want our kids to grow up knowing people and knowing God and loving God and loving people. We want it to be real. And we'd rather do it at that scale if it was real and it could be reproducing itself. So that's why we moved from Chicago out to the Tacoma and started something called Soma Communities along with the Vanderstelts. Started just living like missionaries in our neighborhood. We didn't know anybody and we didn't have any income. <laughs> it was like as if we had been sent into another country, really. It was an amazing process to watch as relationships were built. People start to build trust, then want to know more about why we live the way we live. And we had, of course, tell them about Jesus. And then they got real interested in that and how we raised our kids this way and how did that work? And how come you've been married so long? We don't see that very much. And sometimes I like to say the kingdom of God expands at the speed of relationship. And then the gospel moves along the pathways of trust. And that's what I see Jesus doing. I, I see him building relationships over years with just a dozen. <laughs> the kingdom of God expands at the speed of relationship. And then the gospel moves along the pathways of trust. And that's how he made disciples. And that's how we get to. But I'll tell you, once you do, there's no going back. Once you live this way, a lifestyle discipleship, there's no going back to just check in the box for like an hour and a half on Sundays. 1.8 times a month or whatever it is now. <laughs> if this group of people that you encountered after you, you know, you left the non-disciple making church, much like I did, sounds sounds like we have a similar story in, in that in that thread at least. If they don't come along and disciple you, are you on this track that you're on now? Well, I'm gonna say yes because God is sovereign and He's gonna fill the world with His glory, and it only happens through disciple making. So I'm gonna I'm gonna guess yes. <laughs> How do I know? But I'll tell you what. 
before we came out to Tacoma to live this life and said, we're going to live like missionaries, like family with people, help them to walk in the ways of Jesus so they come to know the truth and get set free. I knew that I couldn't just stay running the program. I knew that was not going to, that would not get it done. That Jesus had not come and died so we could sit in rows primarily in silence for about an hour and a half, sing a couple of camp songs and then head home. There's no way. That can't be all of it. And I I, I grew up in it, so I get that. I love that. But I knew that that was not <laughs> the church I see in scripture. And it's not the church in the book of Acts. Now, as we've come to realize, you get to actually be the church and live this way. So yeah, I, could, I couldn't keep living that way. It was just, it was too small of a gospel. Well, I guess that's what I'm asking, because a lot of times, at least what I've encountered with some folks is, is that they think they can have that pinpoint moment. They're like, okay, if this doesn't happen, if I go left instead of going right, or if I go straight instead of taking a U-turn, like they've been able to go back and say, well, if these series of events didn't happen this way, I don't know if I would still be on this path. Yeah, it's hard to know because you look in hindsight and you see what God's done. My wife and I are serial entrepreneurs. And we've owned and operated over 25 businesses and nonprofits. And I look at all those and I go like, man, some of those didn't seem like they all fit together. But now I look at our life as church planners and disciple makers and starting of missional communities. And I go, wow, I see how God has used all of that stuff. So if I hadn't have been a record producer, would I still be a church planner? I think so. If I if I hadn't run a branding company and licensing firm, would I still be making disciples in community? Probably. Does all that stuff serve me? And does it somehow enrich in my ability to get to know people and understand them and how to communicate maybe the gospel in some new ways and different ways. I think it has all been sovereignly woven together. And I think God's doing that in in a lot of people's lives. If we've been sold a very small little half a gospel that's primarily about me and my afterlife upgrade, and that's it. And so I'm back to living the American dream life for me, my time, my schedule, my personal walk, my personal relationship, my personal quiet time, then that might be all I get. But I'm here to tell you there is way more because the kingdom has come and we get to live in it. Jesus said as much. We live expectantly now that God's going to do amazing things every day and turns out he does. And I, I love it. I love him. Is this idea that no matter where I've been, no matter what I've encountered, no matter what I've experienced truly is the sovereignty and the amazingness of God can say, hey, all these things prepared me for discipleship. All these things kind of kind of culminated in coming together in this perfect storm of saying, okay, now you're ready to really, truly go make this your, your, I hate to say lifestyle, but your choice to say, hey, I'm going to be a disciple maker no matter where I am, no matter what I do, because this is such, this is such a powerful calling on my life. And for those who are maybe listening to this and and they're thinking, but I've not been discipled in this way where the gospel is spoken into every area of our life and we do life together and we see each other's marriages and budgets and homes, lives and our parenting and all, then I'd say pursue it. Find those people. Pray and ask God to, to move you into that. If you find yourself in a church that has little to nothing to do with disciple making, pray and ask God to either change that, use you to change that, or to lead you somewhere where you can be discipled. Or... Give me a call and and we'll help you. (laughs) I promise. I promise. If God's tapping your heart that there's got to be more than just the get out of hell card and the afterlife upgrade, and I promise you there really is, then then go for that. Ask him to show you the way. He will. I really believe that. Hardest part about disciple making would be what? Dying to my own desires, preferences, schedule, fear of man, what everybody's going to think of me if I keep throwing these parties and inviting folks over. What if they think we're weird? We were accused of being a cult (laughs) multiple times because we were always throwing parties and having people around. And then people, they they would risk it and they'd come over and like, we thought you guys were a cult. You're cool. Like, this is fun over here. What's going on? When you live this way, when you live out loud and free, sometimes you start to wonder. A lot of times the people we coach, one of the biggest hurdles to live in this way, getting started is my schedule has been packed by me for my own glory and preference. I'm really fearful to step outside of my comfort zone where I get to protect my identity and what everybody thinks of me. That's the starting point on all this. We say we're starting in the mirror. We're going to look deep in there. And so what's our unbelief? How we describe discipleship, Neil, is this process of moving from unbelief to belief in light of the gospel in absolutely every area of life. Moving from unbelief to belief in light of who is God and what's he done into Christ. What's that say about our identity and how we get to live in every area of life, not just our sin and need for atonement and therefore our ticket to heaven. What about everything else? That process, if it's all of life, then it, then you have to be in 
personal life with people. Spend that time and build those relationships and give yourself away and die. My wife and I live open door. We we always kind of have our whole marriage, even before we really understood why. <laughs> what is open door? Help me understand that. It means that people stop by all the time and they know they can and they don't. we don't have big events that have to be planned out. People can just come by. And because we live that way, we can also get on a Facebook group or a Boxer or WhatsApp or call a bunch of people and say, hey, we're thinking about doing this tonight or tomorrow. You guys up? Yeah, we're up. And so life becomes much more open that way. And instead of closed, we're like, well, I would never stop by someone's house unless it was a pre-scheduled event. Like our house could get to and people do all the time. <laughs> and we've kind of always lived that way and have people living with us and staying with us because there again, they have to be exposed to the gospel in all of life. And so if we hide that away and they only kind of get that when I'm on stage preaching and or in this class this nine week class, how are they going to see what it looks like, how we parent our kids or how I speak to my wife or now I parent my grandkids? How are they going to be exposed to all that and how the gospel is transforming all that? Yeah, they have to They have, to have access to our lives. You make discipleship sound glamorous, by the way. Like there's no challenges. There's no hiccups. There's no setbacks. There's no disappointments. There's none of that. You make it sound so amazing. Well, it is amazing, but you asked me what the hard parts were and I just got done telling you. It's not too glamorous to die to yourself and to like quit trying to own your calendar. And it's not glamorous to open yourself and your life and your home and your finances and your marriage and your attitude problem up to everybody so they can see your redemption happening. <laughs> That's not glamorous. Well, I don't look at having people in my house and in my home and in my life as a hassle. But I think there's many that were like, whoa, listen, okay, I know I need a disciple. I've read Matthew chapter 28. I know I need to do that. Oh, yep. Okay, great. Hands up no, on that. it's not you need to. It's you get to. And there's a huge difference. <laughs> need to is like, I need to because I'm supposed to and should. And I would say, stop shooting all over yourself. There's no should in the gospel. You get to. You get to. I appreciate the correction there. <laughs> That's a huge difference, though. I think so many people think of it as I should be discipling. Yeah. I should be inviting people into my house. I should have an open door. I should be going to coffee more with JoJo at my yeah. work, whatever. But they keep saying, well, I don't know enough of the Bible. Because they haven't been discipled, probably. They ask me about something I have no idea about. And how am I going to answer and rectify the Old Testament and all this stuff? And so then what happens, at least what I've experienced in my uh, years of church, is then what happens is, is they say, say nothing. Exactly. You're 100% right. And then what happens to our world if said person says nothing? Yeah. We, we use a term called gospel fluency. It's this idea of becoming fluent in the language of the gospel. It's very different than Bible literacy. You can know all the facts about the Bible, not know the gospel and not know the Father's heart. And so we use the term gospel fluency, this ability to speak and live and enjoy the gospel connected to all of life. And most of us, just like you said, I 100% agree, don't have a fluency of the gospel that sounds normal. It's not weird and freaky or preachy or pushy because we know it. We can just tell, I, I, I don't know how to make that good news. I, I will just close my mouth. When we listen to our pastor's sermons very often, though we maybe grew up in it so we kind of understand it, we intrinsically understand that the language that it's spoken in and a lot of the verbiage and ease, Christian ease and stuff that's connected, that if I could even reproduce that sermon faithfully, my neighbors and my friends at work would not understand it. It's too wrapped in that. If we understand the gospel truly and how it speaks to the thing behind the thing, to the pains of life, the hopes, the dreams, all that stuff, we can learn this. It's a language, the language of the gospel. We can become fluent in the gospel. Then our fear of being able to good news people <laughs> comes down. We get to practice this in a safe community. We get to practice this at home. We get to practice this in a missional community or a life group or a small group. But if we can learn that fluency together and practice that, then what happens is it starts to leak out into normal everyday conversations. It really, really does. That's one of the things that we teach and coach to, and it, it takes a while. I mean, you can imagine if we started right now today, how long would it take to learn, say, French. Years, right? Gospel fluency takes a while too. It's not, you're not going to read a book and go, I got it. I read a book on Spanish and I'm fully fluent. <laughs> it takes a while and it takes practice, but it's totally doable. Here's the crazy thing though. As, as we grow in our fluency, we begin to good news our own hearts and others. We're so set free. We get so set free. When we're speaking in, in a community and applying the gospel to someone's, maybe they're about to lose their job or maybe, you know, God forbid they've lost a child. You know, they were pregnant and they lost a child or whatever. All these life issues that we 
we come up against, the gospel speaks into them, even though maybe that's not my personal issue as a man, or I'm not losing my job. The good news of the gospel just, oh, it's like a balm to my heart as well. And we all get enriched by it. And that's what we experience. That's what you saw Jesus doing. You know, you've heard it said, but I say, and he was always kind of retweaking the understanding of what the law was about and what the word was about and what the kingdom was about and who his dad really was and what his dad was like. <laughs> he thought dad was angry and distant and ticked off at everybody. He's like, no, no, no. First miracle, a couple hundred gallons of wine. If you want to know what dad's like, dad's into partying. Good uh, take on the Canaan miracle. But here's where I'm at. I hear you saying a lot of sharing the gospel. Now, help me with my understanding here. And maybe this is where I can get some some education and, and others can as well. Sharing the gospel, is that different than disciple making? Because in my mind, it is. Because I can share the gospel. I mean, I can take an object, any object you want to grab, any household thing, anything, and I can turn it into a gospel message. I was raised in a youth group, as I mentioned already, Christian Missionary Alliance, where my youth leader would do that. He would bring this paper bag, truly, and it had just random items in it. One time it was a light bulb. Another time it was like a plug-in. Just random stuff that he found around his house. All these tricks on how to transition any conversation exactly. into a gotcha. That's not evangelism, by the way, nor discipleship. Go ahead. <laughs> I was taught that stuff too. No, and, and that's what I'm trying to ask is, is that because I was trained in that way, I can do that. I can do that pretty much with anything. And so I guess that's where I'm asking is, is that sharing the gospel is one thing. Discipling somebody, I feel like is it's it's a whole different no, ballgame. it's exactly the same. So speak to that. So back to the definition. Discipleship is the process of helping each other move from unbelief to belief in the gospel in every area of life. See, we tend to make the gospel so, so tiny, and it's a message about your sin and your afterlife. But Jesus never, ever said it that way. Never. He never said it that way. The kingdom had come, and the good news was is that now because of him, his sacrifice, we could be forgiven, set free, and now that had ripple effects across Every relationship and hope and dream and past hurt and our futures and our afterlife and all of it. That definition, helping people move from unbelief to belief in light of the gospel in absolutely every area of life. That Jesus says in John 8, if you will walk in my ways, you'll come to know the truth of the gospel connected to this particular area of your life. If you trust me and walk in my ways in this area, for instance, let's say generosity. I'll pick that because most Christians give very, very little. I think the average out there is three and a half to five percent of Christians tithe. It's probably less now. I used to know that number when I was at the mega church. Most Christians don't believe the gospel when it comes to generosity and whose stuff it is. Or they would live very, very generously. Just truth of it. Jesus says, if you'll walk in my ways when it comes to generosity, trust me, I own it all. It's all yours now. You're co-heirs with me. Then you'll come to know the truth of that and you'll get set free and you'll quit being anxious about your finances and you'll quit squirreling stuff away so you can have a big pile of money to leave behind when you die <laughs> that you can't take with you. Why would you do that? That makes no sense at all. If you'll walk in my ways, you'll come to know the truth. So what he was doing and what we get to do is help everybody understand. Now, what's the gospel in that? If we're trying to understand God's generosity, where's the big E in the I chart? Where's the exclamation point? It's at the cross. If you have doubts, I just had a conversation this afternoon with a guy who is making some really big strides to get freed up from layers and layers of ministry, quote unquote, responsibility, so that he can begin to make disciples in his neighborhood with his family. And God is opening doors so fast, he's a little freaked out. That includes leaving his job at a church. Though God's opened up doors for other things way closer to the neighborhood street level and provision. But he was still fearful because I asked him, so what's the worst thing that happened? He goes, I'll lose my house and we'll be homeless. And I said, have you ever come close to that? No. And so we had to talk about then that a father who would send his son and give his whole life, that level of generosity is not going to let you live in a cardboard box under a bridge with your kids, bro. It's not going to happen. The good news of Christ's death and resurrection, his sacrifice, is that we can trust him for provision way smaller than that, and he'll prove it faithful. And if you'll walk in his ways, You'll come to believe that truth. You'll know that truth. How do you get to know it? Maybe when I was in need and I'm in community with you, you paid my electric bill for me, man. Humbling. It was crazy. In fact, a whole bunch of people pitched in. When my car was on the fritz for the billionth time, you're like, you know what? I got a buddy who swings right past here anyway. You just take my car this week, man, and I'll catch a ride. I know another guy. Maybe he can get this fixed. Let me give him a call and see what I can do. See, if you'll walk in my ways, trust me, I will meet those needs. I will provide that. And if you ever doubt it, just look back to the cross and look at the greatest provision ever. That God has dealt with all of our issues and been our provision to the nth degree. We can learn how that 
fits into every area of our life. Our identity, our fear of what other people think, what's going to happen if our kids don't get perfect grades so they don't get to the perfect school so they don't get perfect jobs so they don't, you know, all that stuff the gospel speaks to. And that's what gospel fluency addresses. If you think about it, if discipleship's this process of moving from unbelief to belief in light of the gospel, then gospeling our hearts is how we grow in Christ. It's also how we come to Christ. So Jesus never said that, believe a message and then I'll disciple you, did he? He discipled people to the truth and then on to maturity. Jesus never discipled Christians, not once. There weren't any. And when he sent his disciples out to make more disciples, there weren't any Christians. Clearly what he said and modeled and then said in John 8, you disciple people, you gospel their hearts to the truth, and then that truth sets them free. It's a pretty different picture than I grew up with. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a different photograph than I've ever seen before. If yeah. we're going to look at and it from that it's really standpoint. the only picture in scripture. Right. <laughs> but we've built our systems and we've built our institution and we've built our programming. And that's what most of us know. And so we're like, yeah, that's all I know. Right. That's, that's, how, that's how I was raised. I never realized that there was violet opposed to just only purple as an example. Yeah. Another shade of it. But here's my question. I think of myself as a pretty knowledgeable person when it comes to the Bible. Christian only appears three times. Disciple appears way more times than three times. How many times the word pastor is in scripture? I don't know. I've never looked that one up. Once? One time. Oh, nice. Once in nice. the New Testament. An evangelist probably in that same thread, I would imagine. A lot more than that. Disciple okay. a zillion times. But my point is, is that when people ask me like, oh, are you a Christian? I immediately will correct them and I'll say, well, actually, no, actually I'm a disciple of Jesus. And they, what, what does that mean? And again, there's that little nuance for me that I can say, well, let me tell you what that means. Exactly. How would you answer that? Well, I was going to ask you that. You can't steal my question. You said it. I didn't say it. <laughs> so here's the thing. I'm right away. Here's where my mind goes, Neil. Disciples make disciples. Disciples of Jesus make more disciples. So I'd say, oh, cool. Who are you discipling right now? And that's what I would play the cricket sound. <laughs> okay. So then you shouldn't use that answer. For me, you bring up a valid point. We have to get our language right. And I love that you use that analogy with the French and the Spanish like immediately, like you're not going to just speak that immediately. Like you have to get that down. And I think that's such a profound thought process. Can I really say I'm a disciple maker if I'm not discipling people? And your answer is no, I can't. I can't say that. Well, you, could you say like, I'm an automaker if you don't make cars? No, you know. Right. <laughs> right. Or I, I'm, a, I'm a chef. Like, what do you cook? Well, I don't cook. My wife does all the cooking. Why do you say you're a chef? <laughs> we wouldn't. You know, I'm a motivational speaker. Well, great. What stages are you been on? Well, uh, you know, I'm still living in a van down by the river, me and Matt Foley, but you know. <laughs> but in your mind, what is a disciple? And then maybe the, the flip side of that coin is what is a disciple maker? Oh, I, boy, I hate getting pigeonholed for these concise little one sentence answers because I don't have one. Well, you don't have to give a one sentence answer. I mean, if it's more, if you, if you have more, you can give more. I think if we go back to the scripture and go, what were the people that Jesus called his disciples and what did they do? do. They lived with Jesus. They follow him around. So they lived in the ways of Jesus. They listened to and learned the words of Jesus. And then he sent them out to do the works of Jesus. And I think I think that's what it means to be a disciple. Now, to, to be a disciple maker then is to do the same. Jesus says, okay, as I was sent, so I send you now. And then he breathes his own breath onto them. And he says, now go, receive the spirit, go and make disciples. Now they were Jews. So what they did was they immediately connected the dots back to Genesis, where it says that God God created the first man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed his own breath into him, giving him life. It's the same words and language. And then he sent them out to be fruitful and multiply, filling the world with his glory. When Jesus said that to his disciples, now go, as I've been sent, I send you. And he breathed his breath on them. Now receive the spirit. Go make disciples everywhere, all over the world, every nation, every neighborhood, every family, every nook and cranny of life. They understood that, well, this is a recapitulation of why God created the world and why we've even been put on it. And so they, they took it very seriously because they realized, hey, wait a minute, that's why we exist. Like I say, birds don't fly because they're supposed to, or they should. Birds fly because they get to. We get to make disciples of Jesus and be his disciple, nor is to walk in his ways, speak his words, do the works of Jesus, blessing people, living as a servant. We get to is we are created in his identity to be like him. How he's filling the world with his glory is now through humans. Paul called that the mystery revealed. How's God going to fulfill all these prophecies about 
fill in the world with his glory. Paul says, angels are long to look into this forever. He's going to do it through humans. Crazy. I'm going to put my own spirit in them and they're going to go out and live in my ways and then lead others to do that. Just like it was in the garden. To be a disciple is step one. And then to be a disciple maker kind of is that step down the road is once you realize, hey, I have this commission. I've been commissioned. I get to go make disciples. I get to be a part of this mission that you're a part of, that I'm a part of as well. It's not, it's not like we're trying to do long division underwater blindfolded, really just being in people's lives and inviting them into your life and then sharing the gospel. It's really that simple. As you simple. walk with Jesus. There again, back to John We try 9. to make it so complicated. Yeah, you know, you're right. But it's that simple. It truly is that simple. That's why it was such a mind-blowing illumination, John 8. If you'll walk in my ways and be my disciple, then you'll come and know the truth. You'll come to know the truth, and that truth will set you free. We're like, well, wait a minute. We've been doing it backwards. A, that's a problem. Secondly, okay, so then that's what Jesus was doing. That's how he discipled them. He invited them to walk in his ways with them, and they came to know the truth, and that set them free, and they went out and changed the whole world. And you and I are talking today on this podcast about it because of them, because of what he taught them and sent them out to do in his own power and strength by his spirit. That's obviously the key thing here. And I think we do leave out the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the primary discipler of our heart. Hearts. I, I'm not that wise. I am not that perfect. I am not that nice 24 7 to everybody who I encounter. The power that raised Christ from the dead, the Holy Spirit, can do that, can lead people to, into relationship with us, can show us their needs, can show us the things that we've been blessed with that we now get to bless them with. Come and walk in the ways with us. We're going to figure this out together as the Spirit guides us. And that's, that's what I read in the book of Acts over and over. So, what if every church said, okay, what Caesar's saying is amazing. We're not doing that. Head pastors all around the world, the Louis Giglios of the world, the Joel Osteens. I don't know those guys. You don't know Joel well, Osteen? I know Come on. Him. I don't know him. Well, I'm guessing you probably don't like have his personal cell phone number. If you did, I'd I like it to a lot be of people's show, personal but... cells, but not those two. I don't <laughs> Not those two. All right. I well, I was I hoping at least yours. for one of them. And we're talking here. <laughs> well, you could have it whenever you want. But here's my question. These mega churches that I see on TV that you came out of, in a sense, came out of that type of ministry. If they really, truly took the discipleship seriously, like you're saying. As a lifestyle. Oh, here we go again. We we have to disciple. Oh, drudgingly doing it. Or they think of it as a series of classes I got to take people through. If they took it seriously, like, again, we get to, not we have to, which I really love the phrasing, by the way. That's why I'm bringing it back again. If they really took that seriously, what do you think our world would look like? I think we'd probably have a lot more smaller gatherings of believers believers sharing their lives with people in so many different flavors, colors, textures, speeds, because everybody's different and introverted people lead at a different pace than ex high, highly extroverted do. You look at the five-fold ministry of apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher, all those people will build different types of communities and lead from different positions. That's why we need each other so much. So I think if they took it seriously, for one, they'd be less in the office and less holed up in the building, and they'd be more at their kitchen table or dining room table or at other people's tables with them and a lot more in the neighborhood. The crazy thing is, it's so expensive and almost impossible to reproduce that crazy big giant model. Even if it's a thousand people, your average person sitting out there on Sunday can never reproduce that. Having a weekly open table where you just say, hey, you know what, my, my family and I, we're eating anyway on Thursday. You know, pick a day. It doesn't matter. I'll just say Thursday. We eat, we eat every day. It's crazy. I don't want to act fancy and everything or like I'm rich, but we eat every day. We're just going to go ahead and pick Thursday. And that's going to be a night that we just, anybody we run into, we go, hey, Thursdays, come on over. We do open table. Just get to know the neighbors. A bunch of cool people come and we just hang. Come on by. You just do that. You do that predictable pattern and you just open up your one night a week. Just start there and you start having folks over and then invite them to walk in the ways with you. See, see, as we started doing that and like just our kids wanted to bring their friends home for family dinner night. And when we moved to Tacoma and started church planting this way, our house was just filled with people who wanted to eat and hang out and watch our cable and do all that. And we just invited them into every bit of the fabric and wrinkles of our life. Good, bad and ugly. I'm not joking. They've all seen my wife and I fight and forgive and they've seen us broke and they've seen us make some money and they've seen me be a bad parent. And they've seen me seek forgiveness for my kids, all those kinds of things. And then the gospel being sort of woven with intentionality into all of that. So I, I, I would love to see way less giant, non-reproducible, super expensive organizational level things that Jesus could have pulled off but never chose to, and a whole lot more smaller, multiple textured. Now, that doesn't mean we can't regather them up. I am not anti-gathering them up in big crowds. Like Jesus preached to the crowds. We get to. He hung out with those who 
followed him around. He only discipled those who would do life with him, though. And then even that, he didn't guess at it. He asked Dad, Dad, who would be the ones? Well, you're my son, and you're perfect, and you have the power of the Spirit in you. I'm going to give you a dozen. And yet somehow we think we can take thousands, and perfect sermons will get it done. It's, it's, it's really it's tough sled, man. And I love to preach and I love preaching. <laughs> I love hearing people preach. That's not disciple making. That's not discipleship. Well, even the dozen, he narrowed it down to three. Sometimes. I mean, he spent three and a half years with a dozen guys, but sometimes he was with three. Well, right. But I'm just saying, sometimes he took the three yep. and kind of pulled them aside yep. and had a little kind of one-on-one, if you just will. Just like a family. Think about it. You, have, you got kids, Neil? I do. Yep. 15 year Okay. Old. Just so one. So Tina and I have three kids and sometimes the five of us would do everything together. But sometimes I just take my son out. I, my daughter's on dates individually. I take my wife on a weekly date night. Most weeks. Not perfectly. <laughs> she she would tell you. We, we, we've been married coming up on 40 years. It's, it's been a lot, of, a lot of date nights. Sometimes we're all together. Sometimes it's just, I think last time my wife was just with the two daughters. And our granddaughter, we have one granddaughter. She's only three. But they were doing a special night together. Well, wait wait a minute. What happened? Why isn't everybody there? How come they didn't take attendance? I wasn't there. It doesn't count. No. (laughs) Just like family life. Yeah, Jesus was, like I said, he preached to the crowds. He hung out with those who followed him around and wanted to listen in. He did life with a dozen, sometimes with three, sometimes just with one, the beloved John. John was his favorite, it seemed. Not supposed to have favorites, but it seems that Jesus did. (laughs) Two things that come to mind. One, I don't know if you're a big Star Wars guy or not. I don't go to conferences or dress up, but I love Star Wars. All right. So the Mandalorian, some people have been throwing rocks at it, and rightfully so. I mean, some of the, some of the episodes have been questionable. I was warned off of season three, so don't okay. waste your time. Yeah, don't waste your time. There is a reoccurring phrase that I really love, and it says this. He says, this is the way. And I really love that. The first time I heard that, I'm like, man, that is so good. This is, you know, in scripture, this is the, the church way. was was referred to as the way. It was the way. Like, how do you, how do you live? Well, we'll show you the way. It was beautiful. And I always thought, oh man, like, can't, can't, why can't we just use that? And that's because back in the 70s or 80s, a cult absconded with that. And there's still little remnants of it, I guess, called the way. And you're like, dang it. <laughs> Robbed us of that. Took it away. I agree with you. Isn't it beautiful? The way. It is. And, and that's what I really resonated with. To me, what you're saying when I hear you talk about discipleship is this is the way. This is the way to do it. This is the way that we have to do it. And again, I, I know it. the have to makes it sound like an ultimatum, but I really feel like it's such a serious thing that people need to really gravitate towards that they really should. This is the way. This is the right way. I would only add one caveat to that. Not going to look one way. Like, I don't want anybody hearing like, well, this guy Caesar comes on and says his way of doing it's the only way to do it. I'm not saying that. What I will say, though, is the only way you'll make mature disciples is in community, in a gospel-centered community living on mission. One-to-one disciple making alone will not get it done. And here's why. Neil, if you and I met, let's say you're a neighbor of mine, we met, we kind of hit it off. We like Star Wars, man. We're always jamming, watching stuff together. We start getting into Jesus and you start, man, I didn't grow up this way, but you know, so I disciple you one-to-one. After two or three years, who are you going to most resemble spiritually? You. Yeah, right? Me. Now, that might be an upgrade in the sense that you learn some things. You maybe, maybe you quit living as a thief or a drug dealer or whatever. It might be an upgrade in that sense. But here's the thing. We're not called to make disciples of Caesar or of any one person. We're called to make disciples of Jesus. And now all this idea of the body of Christ comes into play, doesn't it? See, it takes the whole body, all the different age and stage and experiences and spiritual giftings and wisdom and all that to make a mature disciple. See, we need to be in a community where all of that is rubbing up against us and moving us from unbelief to belief and causing my lack of knowledge to surface or my lack of belief or my preferences, or I don't like that kind of, you know, I don't want to do what, like all that happens in community. It doesn't doesn't happen necessarily one-to-one in the same richness. How could it? I'm not Christ. And just ask my wife, ask my best friend. I'd say, he's a pretty good guy. He ain't Jesus man yet, you know? (laughs) We need the body together to become like Christ because none of us are alone. So I'm not saying that you never are going to be just like with your kids one-to-one. You're going to have times when you're having a conversation with somebody. But if you're just going to sit down and study the Bible one-to-one together, that person will not become like Christ. They'll become like you. Pushes up against, again, something that we're doing recently at our church, and we call it this six-week study that you take somebody through who basically doesn't know anything about the Bible, and it kind of gives you like an overview of the Bible and discipleship, baptism, and all this stuff. And at the end of it, the idea is once you complete this six-week study, 
we do it in our men's group and, and you get a challenge coin, which is kind of silly. And then we pass that on. Now, now that I've done it with, let's say you, now your job is to now go find Jojo or Jimmy or someone else to now then walk them back through that and then doing it one at a time, one by one by so one. What end? What's the end though? What's the goal? I don't know. The, the goal is to continue to do it. I, see, I don't think taking people through some knowledge base is bad, but to what end? If it's to help them count the cost, hey, do I want to join the community? I'm not talking about joining your church service. I'm saying, do I want to start hanging out with you and your family more? And you got some friends that seem really cool. And they're also claiming to walk with Jesus and try to figure this out. Let me give you the bigger picture. For us, we do that through story. We, we teach the Bible through what we call the story of God. We teach it through narrative and dialogue, and we do it real early in relationship with people so that they can get the whole biblical arc, the whole redemptive arc early on. Most Christians don't know it. I was in church for 40 years before I heard it. Well, one big story like that, super clear, all connected. That's who God really is. That's why we're created and put on the planet. That's how the church gets to live. Are you kidding me? There again, if they go through that story with us and say, not for me, well, then they're not going to get to be discipled. That's not usually the case. We always see people move from unbelief to belief in some phenomenal ways when they go through the story of God. It's powerful. It sets people free. A lot of our church structure and organization and how we do things came from a ministry actually up in your neck of the woods in Idaho called mm -hmm. Real Life Ministries. Yeah. Jim Putman, kind of overseer of that. And they do a whole lot of story. And they were actually trained by some of the same folks that trained us. There's some very big overlap in that. It's powerful. Yeah, we started every missional community that way, every church plant that way. I've told the story of God hundreds of times. I've lost count <laughs> all over the world. It's it's nuts. So I'm not saying that taking someone through a seven-week thing or something, but to what end? If it's to help them count the cost so they can then jump into community life and say, yeah, I, I, I want to be a disciple of Jesus. Or I, I, I've even gotten to the point where I want him to be Lord of my life. I don't even know what that looks like because right now I'm Lord of my life and I'm screwing up most of it. And that's what this six-week study does is it kind of takes you from the beginning of it. They're dead. Then they become an infant. Then they become a baby and so on and so on and so on. Yeah, it's hard to grow up a, anybody in seven seven lessons, man. Right. No, you can't. But the idea is, is that then you get kind of plugged into the men's group and then they kind of come around you and this community around you. And then, you know, hey, you're brand new. Why don't you come walk with me. Let me show you what I do. And okay, you walked with me a little bit. Why don't you go hang out with John or Joe? Or Why don't you all just do it together with your family and your yeah, kids and your we wives? We don't really do it that way. That. We, maybe we should. You got to. Well, now we get now to. Now you get to. See, now you know. I get to. I, I get to. So I want to read this verse. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21, just because was right in line, I feel like, with what we're talking about. It says, For God called you to do good, even if it means sacrificing. Just as Christ sacrificed for you, he is the example and you must follow in his footsteps. When you hear that, what comes to mind? came to mind is the verse that says, it's not your sacrifices I'm looking for, it's your obedience and trust. I don't think we'll walk in the ways with Jesus if we don't trust him. And we'll see everything that I don't get to do, that I like to do, all my weekends away, my time on the boat, in my extra house, I want this car, and I want, we'll see it all as sacrifice. And we'll say, yeah, I'm sacrificing for Jesus. Mm, I, I, and God says, I don't want your sacrifice, I want your heart. That's what comes to mind when I heard that. Because I think for you, if I'm hearing again correctly, this idea, if I'm going to be a true disciple maker, it's going to come from the heart first. I mean, ultimately, maybe not first. We've, we've discipled so many people that they go, oh, we're in. Like everything you're talking about here, man, like this sounds great. Okay, we're in. Then as they start to walk in those ways and count the cost, they bristle a little because it, it's like, ooh. And it feels like great sacrifice before it starts to feel like great gain. Usually about a year to two years into it, they start to go, oh my goodness, enough of the onion got peeled. I feel like I need to start at the beginning. We hear it all the time. And I think that I think that the same thing happened with the disciples. They were all like, Rabbi says, follow him. We got looked, we got kind of passed over. That's why we're fishermen and stuff like working for the, enemy collecting taxes and stuff. A rabbi just said, come and hang. Here we go. We're hanging. We're hanging. We're hanging. Two years, three years, all of a sudden they're coming up on three and a half. And he goes, oh, by the way, I'm going to be taken, beaten and tried as a criminal and put to death. And when that happens, you're all going to run away and hide. And they were like, no, nah, we're not. Gonna. And they all did. <laughs> there is this process of dying. You, know, you asked me earlier, what's the hardest part about making disciples? You know, his lifestyle. It's dying to how much I love Caesar. Man, I love Caesar. My day goes so perfectly, Neil, when everything goes exactly as I want it to go. Like today, I was here by myself in this, you know, beautiful condo here, you know, by the water doing some work. 
I was in charge of my day. It went perfect. <laughs> if I was at home and there was a lot of folks hanging out in community and all, yeah, guess what? Maybe I end up getting some stuff broken or stolen or people ask for help when I it's late and I feel like going to bed or someone asks me a question that I don't know if I want to answer or someone puts it on me like, I didn't like the way you said that. Or, hey, the other day when you're over, you were really rude to your wife. Like, what's up with that, man? I thought you were a Christian. No, it's messy. <laughs> It's render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's. <laughs> boy, oh boy, that's a hard one when you're multi-generational uh, that's, what gonna, that's what came to my mind when you were talking about I'm that. I'm the third, my son's the fourth, my grandson's the fifth. There's, There's a, lot a lot of rendering, lot of rendering going, on. going on. So Caesar, tell us how folks can get connected with you and where should they go find you? I would love it if some folks would come and just hang out with me at the Everyday Disciple podcast. February had our six-year anniversary every Monday for six years. Hard to believe. <laughs> lots and lots of episodes. We call it Everyday Disciple because it's that. It's like, how would the gospel speak into everyday life? And what would this lifestyle of discipleship really look like? And there's hundreds of topics that we've talked about and covered. It's very conversational. It's very, very normal. Now, some people might listen to this and go like, not for me. I'll just keep 1.8 times a month in it in the rows and wait for heaven. But if you're interested in this and go like, man, I really do want to live like Jesus and what he sent us to do. This is scaring me a little bit. I get it. I really do. Maybe check out the Everyday Disciple podcast. You can find it everywhere that podcasts are. They're starting to kind of bang on the name and sort of steal it like Everyday Disciples. And so it's the Everyday Disciple podcast, little feet running across the logo. Or you can go to everydaydisciple.com and find it there. There's also, we have so many free tools and resources and you can get books and zillions of videos and audios. And I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we put out there just to help folks start to taste and see and then or help them put together a full framework for discipling. That's what we do in our coaching. We kind of go, here's the full framework from your dining room table all the way out to multiplying communities, maybe gathering up new church plants even. That's not everybody's jam or desire. That's where we came from as church planners. So if they go to everydaydisciple.com, we can hang out. <laughs> and who doesn't want to hang out with Caesar? I don't know. Maybe <laughs> someone wants to. At least check it out. It's, we have fun. <laughs> well, Caesar, before we let you go, two things. I feel like we need to have some silliness. Are you up for that? Depends how silly. I remember one time doing several weeks in the Czech Republic sort of an evangelistic summer camp. And at the end of the whole week, after just serving and lots of sports and meals and preaching our guts out and all that, they, they said, we're going to do something silly now. And they literally had us all bend over and walk around on our hands and knees and they spanked us. And it was the goofiest thing like what that's and to that's them it was disturbing. funny all right so i do this thing at the end of the show called senseless now these five questions involve your senses and then the six is the wild card so i have a die i have a die in a cup so i'm going to randomly roll it for you and then we'll see the number and then the number will correspond with the question i don't trust you with that i don't know which die number goes oh, to which question wow. Go all ahead. right wow here we go <laughs> i'm guessing you're a sports fan so no gonzaga i'm not a huge sports fan no. All right, question oh, number three. three. Yes. Biblical number, Trinity. Oh, Love it. Let's oh. go. Question number three. So good. Question number three is this. What is something you smell? So again, involving your senses. Something you smell that when you get a whiff of it, you have to smell more of it. Probably any food cooked with garlic. Really? No such thing as a little garlic. So like garlic fries, like at a baseball game? Oh, yeah. Garlic truffle. Gar Let's just now, now we're going deep. Garlic <laughs> truffle. If I smell some garlic and truffle, even on your breath, I'd, I would move closer. I'd be like, yeah, yeah. You like garlic that much? Yeah. That's fascinating to me. That's why I, I love this question. I was going to name specific foods, but a whole bunch came to mind real quick. And I was like, but what's the common thread there, garlic? Garlic. So vampires, if there were such a thing, would be repelled by you. Maybe. I don't think I smell like garlic. I've heard that vampires don't like garlic, so. Yeah, I've heard that. I don't know if that's true or not. If there's even vampires, who knew? <laughs> uh, Caesar, thanks so much for hanging out with us. I really appreciate the time that you gave us. If somebody truly is struggling with discipleship and they're thinking again, it's this astronomical, like Mount Everest, marathon type run, whatever like astronomical thing that is so crazy that they can't reach. You're here to tell them what about discipleship? That God has completely designed the rhythms of all of our lives perfectly suited for discipleship. We teach these six rhythms of life that Jesus lived in and Adam and Eve lived in and all of Israel lived in and you and I live in and, and people in Zimbabwe live in. And God has, I'm not, I don't have time to teach it right now, but God has perfectly ordered our lives all with this common set of rhythms that discipleship naturally fits in and since we're already all doing it it's not a matter of add-on it's not it's really it's a matter of moving from thinking discipleship is additional something to add on to our life it's really moving to this mindset of intentional 
moving from additional to intentional, like, hey, meals and getting to know people's stories and looking at everything I've been blessed with as blessed to be a blessing. I wonder how I might bless people with all the stuff that we have and on and on. There's these rhythms that we all live in. And once you see them, you can't unsee them and you start to realize, oh, okay. All right. It's not a matter of additional. It's a matter of intentional. It fits right into my schedule. Once that, once that dime drops, man, it's, it, that's why we say lifestyle. I love that a lot. Well, guys and gals, kids and campers alike, that is it. That is all. That is our show today. See what I mean about the chosen? You've been chosen. Doesn't that feel good? You're not the last kid picked at kickball. You're not still standing there waiting to be on the team. You get to be on the team. How exciting is that? Well, with one little caveat, you have to make the choice to do what Caesar just said. It is a choice and the choice truly is ultimately yours. You know, here's the thing that I always come back to in choices and in life. There's really one decision. And sometimes even doing nothing is still that decision. So hopefully today you're inspired to get to be a part of things. that You don't have to wait any longer. What do I mean by all this? Well, think about it. You get to make that choice to be a part of things. And listen, if you're still on the fence, like confused, what is discipleship? Well, who is Jesus? All this stuff. Boy, have you come to the right place. Because I think today is the best day to be here and to join that conversation, to learn more about that. Because again, I think we heard a powerful message today on how and why it's so important. And I hope you really heard that. If you didn't, rewind it a little bit. There was a lot there, a lot to unpack, but good stuff there. So just remember this before we go. Remember, stay tuned until next week because it's going to be season finale day. You're not going to want to miss it. Guaranteed. You're not going to want to miss next week. It's going to be amazing. So good. Can't wait for our guest. And don't forget, remember, when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. Stay tuned until next week when we walk in other people's shoes.